Um, thanks everybody for coming out uh, to this presentation. Um, but I, I decided to take a different route with it this time and really just focus on those herb herbaceous invasive plants. So if you're here for honeysuckle, I'm sorry, you are in the wrong place. But we will focus on these other groups, uh, these are herbaceous plants. And so just a quick outline of what we're gonna talk about. I will very briefly um, talk about why we need to manage invasive plants. And then really just hit the topics, uh, general management principles, particularly within uh, herbaceous species, talk about why invasive plants uh, impact forest management, management strategies when we're dealing with these plants, some of the techniques that we use, and then the heart of the talk really is this ID and control of different herbaceous invasive species. There's a lot of them in Illinois, so we're not gonna be able to cover all of them. Uh, so we'll hit the highlights of some of those. One thing that I'm not going to do uh, just for time constraints is really do a lot of the background information about what an invasive species is, why we're worried about them, their ecology. If that's something you're interested in, uh, we do have a, a presentation that we recorded last year that's an hour long introduction to invasive species that really does cover the background information. And so um, if you really wanna get that kind of information, the base information about uh, invasive species in general, their ecology, um, go to our Extension Forester YouTube channel and um, look up this presentation. It gives you a lot of good information. Um, I am definitely, I will promise you all that I will finish with plenty of time for questions today. So that's another reason I'm only covering a few species. I wanna have time to address the species that you wanna talk about in the, the Q&A thing at the end. Alrighty, so why do we manage invasive plants? As landowners, as land managers, we manage these invasive species, uh, these invasive plants, because they're doing negative impacts. There's some kind of negative impact for them being on the landscape. And we've seen, the research has found, and, and people have seen that invasive plants can be detrimental to our native plants, our, our natural communities here in Illinois. They can reduce native species diversity, reduce wildlife habitat, um, interrupt important ecosystem functions and processes, impede and restrict the use of your land, what you can do, how you manage your land, um, access to it. You can decrease productivity, um, and we've seen that with some species, even with timber productivity, and just increase the cost that it takes to manage and keep your, your land healthy. So all these reasons um, together are, are just some of the reasons why we want to manage invasive plants. We want to reduce those negative impacts. And this is kind of summed up, and I use this quote a lot. This is from the old Global Invasive Species Initiative website from the Nature Conservancy. Conservancy. And I like, uh, I like the quote, so I stick it in every time I'm talking about invasive species. And they say simply, we control invasive species because they are harming the native plants and animals we care so much about protecting. That to me sums it up perfectly. There's negative impacts from these invasives and we want to reduce or get rid of those negative impacts. Uh, just a side note, that top part of that picture there is bluebells blooming right now at the Dixon Springs Ag Center here in Pope County. I took that picture um, just a couple days ago and um, it's a wonderful time to be out in the woods. Alrighty. So getting into management, when you're wanting to manage invasive species, any invasive plant, really your goal should be to prevent, reduce, or eliminate those negative impacts. Again, that's the reason we're managing these species is because they're negatively impacting the landscape. So when we manage things, it's not necessarily just to kill them to kill them. We're managing them for the goal of preventing, reducing, or eliminating those negative impacts. We can do that in multiple ways. And so management isn't just killing plants. That's part of it, controlling these established infestations, preventing the introduction or spread of new infestations and promoting desirable species and getting healthy ecosystems that are able to resist invasion. I thought it was a couple grammatical errors there, sorry. But um, all of these things together is a more holistic look at management of invasive plants. It's not just controlling infestations together, right? So we got to look at it. The overall goal is getting a healthy ecosystem with native species 
so we don't incur those negative impacts from invasive species. So just in general, some general management principles when you're dealing with invasive species. So the first is marking and survey. And so when you're finding invasive species, particularly new ones or, or infestations that are not yet very widespread, um, it's very, very helpful to mark those infestations in the field or on a map. That allows you to come back and find those infestations. If you're able to kind of get some data on the size of them or, or estimations, it can show you progress in terms of, are you reducing those infestations over time? You can prevent missing one. Um, you can refine them in the field. There's a lot of reasons to do that. And then also some kind of systematic survey can be very helpful in the sense that walking your land in a systematic way, looking for new invasive species, focusing those surveys sometimes on areas where there's a lot of disturbance or high traffic or edge habitats where we know invasives like first, that just helps allow you to find these things early. Um, I like to carry just a roll of flagging or some pin flags with me when I'm walking around and that way if I find a little stand of garlic mustard or some invasive species, put a flag right there, stick some pins in the ground, something like that so you can find it easier again. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of apps out there that you can keep on your phone that will help you mark things in your land. Um, Onyx does that, Avenza is a great one, Edmaps is, a, is an app that's specific to invasive species and there's others out there as well even google maps you can put dots on there and keep them so um, just another way of tracking things on your land that helps you um, follow up and helps you understand and plan your management very very important the next general management principle is this idea of spread prevention so what you don't want to do is you're controlling these invasive species. You don't want to then drag their seeds or their rhizomes all over your land and create new infestations. So cleaning equipment, uh, monitoring disturbed areas, monitoring areas that have had offsite materials like soil or gravel, uh, mulch, anything like that brought onto your land, because that's where those seeds may pop up at first. And we've all seen bush hogs like the one up top, all that trash on the top of the bush, bush hog is probably full of seeds. So taking a few minutes to hose it off or, or blow it off with an air compressor, something like that when you go out of an area that has invasive species and before you move into a new area, just as simple steps that you can do to, to reduce how much these things get spread around. Washing shoes, cleaning shoes is another good way, brushing, uh, clothes or birds off of clothes or, or pets, just little things like that really can um, kind of have long lasting impacts. So spread prevention is very important. It's very cheap in terms of a cheap way to do control instead of trying to actually wait until the infestations are there. In terms of, this kind of goes along with that, but in terms of control, a general management principle is control these infestations before they are widespread and well established. If you uh, have teasel in your open areas, you don't want to wait until it looks like this picture before you start controlling it because it's going to be harder. Uh, you'll have a more developed seed bank um, and it's going to cost a lot more and take a lot more longer time to control those than if you jump on it early before they're really well established when you find those first few teasel plants out there. This goes right along with marking and survey too. Being able to know when a new infestation shows up allows you to control them early before they become a big problem. And then restoration, another good general management principle. I see a lot of people that the only thing they do is kill the invasive plants and then walk away. Uh, the problem is many times the thing that comes back is other invasive species. So taking steps, other steps too, to encourage native species and encourage ecosystem development um, is going to help as you control invasive species as well because it allows for native species to come back, promotes the native species, which can then occupy that space and hopefully help resist some of those um, new invasions coming in. And depending on your land, that could be supplemental planting of natives, adding them in there, adding some kind of cover, uh, non-invasive cover crop in there to uh, hold its place and kind of keep the invasives out managing ecosystems through prescribed fire, through thinning. There's a lot of ways. But what you're trying to do is promote a healthy, vigorous native ecosystem 
which is going to help keep those invasive species out. That's an important principle in overall management. Um, if all you're doing is killing invasives and walking away, you're probably just going to get invasive species back. So I just wanted to throw this picture in here when we talked about spread prevention. I had to sneak a couple pictures of my kids. Uh, they're a lot taller now, so these pictures are a little old. But if you happen to be a land manager or um, a site steward or something, a volunteer steward at an area, um, these little boot brush signs are, I think they're fantastic uh, for a couple reasons. One of the main reasons is they're great on-site educational tools for people to see and understand that you're concerned about invasive species. Um, they're out there already walking your land in a trailhead or something like that. They can get a quick little bit of information about invasives and then an action they can do to help, such as brushing the, the, the seeds off of their boots. The other reason I think they're useful is they actually do get rid of some seeds on there. We, a few years ago now, did a study and um, these boot brushes, when they're used a lot, accumulate this mound of dirt below them that um, kind of came from boots that are um, from boots that have been cleaned on them. So we had the idea to take that pile of, uh, of dirt that accumulates underneath of these boot brushes and grow it out and see what was growing in there. And we had an intern uh, do, do this for a project and she found 39 different species growing, in, um, growing from seed that were collected in that dirt mound below boot brushes. That included four of the species we were targeting at that time uh, that are invasive. Uh, stilt grass, garlic mustard, oriental lady's thumb, and beefsteak plant, and 14 other exotic species that were mostly yard or agricultural weeds, clovers, and things like that. So it, to me, it was really um, convincing evidence that these boots, boot brushes actually do knock seeds off of people's boots, and they have um, value beyond just educational. So just think about that, and in um, Consider that if you are a land manager or somebody that um, deals with um, public land. Alrighty, so invasive plants in forest health. So this I wanted to add in here, um, really just as uh, just as a mention in terms of how we keep our forest healthy and the management we need to do. How does that interact with invasive species? And so what I'm talking about uh, here is, a, and, and I did say earlier, I know, manage your, your area, keep it healthy. The, there are some things that you can expect uh, from the invasive species initially when you start that. In the terms of forest management, timber management can um, stimulate a response from invasive species. A lot of our management in forest here in Illinois is some level of disturbance type management where we're disturbing the soil or just are getting light into the system. And even if those activities aren't directed towards invasive species, the invasives can respond to those and sometimes positively. So um, the management we need to do, like I said earlier, needs to go hand in hand with invasive species control in the sense that um, you don't want the invasives to take advantage of that management more so than our natives. And so, for example, uh, we talk about oak regeneration and we want to get oaks, um, young oaks back onto the landscape at a higher level than they are now. That often means thinning some other species out. And here's a young oak here um, next to a maple that was cut. But the issue, of course, is that light, that disturbance that allows the oak to grow may allow invasive species to grow at the same time. So understanding that that could be an option and then controlling those invasives and taking steps to do that um, in either before or in concert with your forest management will help you prevent these explosions of invasive species and help you get your native species back while tamping down that response from um, invasive species. And if this is something you're interested in, in learning more about, a few years ago, we put together um, a document that really tries to summarize how we think different invasive species respond to forest management or silvicultural practices. Uh, this was written with a focus in the South. This was one I used to work for Georgia, um, but it applies up here as well to similar management types, similar forest types, as well as a lot of the same invasive species. 
This is available on our Extension Forestry website, a PDF of it is. If you're interested in it, it has some good information about um, seed bank viability for different invases, response to disturbance, response to fire. So if you're a forest manager, this is a good way of getting that more information and understanding how those different invasive species may respond. And since we're on the topic of resources, I'll cover a couple other resources that may be helpful when you're managing invasive plants. This is our um, publication we did a couple years ago, the management of invasive plants in Pest of Illinois. We published this um, in partnership with the Morton Arboretum. And so this covers 42 different invasive species that are found in Illinois, as well as some forest pests, some insects. Um, it gives control information, management information. And then we also have this nifty phenology calendar that we built um, based on data that was collected by citizen scientists across Illinois a few years ago. And the idea behind this phenology calendar is it shows you the development and the timing of those plants and how they differ depending on your, whether you're in northern, central, or southern Illinois. It just kind of helps you target your management activities. So a great resource. Um, you can actually pick these up, printed versions of these at most of our extension offices across the state, uh, but you can get the PDF on our website there. Another good resource that focuses on these forest invasive species, and since this is a forestry webinar that's very relevant, is the Field Guide to the in, in Identification of Invasive Plants in the Southern Forest um, by Jim Miller and others. Um, it's a few years old now, but it covers really, really good information and, and, and great pictures on ID, identifying these invasives. Many of these occur in Illinois as well. There is a companion guide called the Management Guide for those same invasive species, but it gives good management information. It's available online. It's also available as an app so you can keep it on your phone. Just another good resource out there. And lastly, uh, in terms of good resources, the Midwest Invasive Plant Network is, um, is a nonprofit that focuses on invasive species in the, the eight kind of standard or, or traditional Midwestern states, including Illinois. And so they have built this database. You can search for invasive species. It gives you control information, whether it's uh, non-chemical control, chemical control, control that can be done by novices or uh, those that are kind of restricted to experts and they're ranked by how effective they are and the short term and the long term um, really gives you tons of information and this is a resource that I use all the time in particular when um, when it's a species I'm not as familiar with and somebody's asking for control or I want to learn about it this is one of the first places I go to to see what's out there all the information in there is backed by research I'm a great resource. All righty. So let's jump into the management strategies for herbaceous invasive plants. And of course, herbaceous plants are non-woody plants. All herbaceous plants will die back to the ground um, in winter, at least. And so they have different strategies than our woody plants, like our shrubs and our trees. But there's still different growth types within this category of herbaceous invasive plants. So I wanted to cover that first, just so that we're all on the same page when we're talking about how these the different strategies these plants use. And so some invasive plants are annuals. And so an annual is a plant that completes its life cycle all the way from germinating from a seed to setting seed and dying in one growing season. Um, they, they flower, they, they, set, they produce fruit or seed one time and then they die, right? So it's all done in one, uh, one year and one growing season. So these plants survive year to year, a population survives year to year solely by seed production with annuals, right? So that's how they go from one year to the next is through seed production. Two examples of annual invasive plants that we have here in Illinois are Japanese stiltgrass and Japanese hops, if you're familiar with those. Now, a biennial plant is similar to an annual, but it takes two growing seasons to complete its life cycle. The first year, they're typically what we call a rosette. So they're low to the ground, basal leaves that are just building up energy and building up root stores for flowering in that second year. 
So the second year they typically flower, produce uh, fruit and seed, and then die. Like an annual, biennials typically only flower and set seed once and then they die. It's just that they have these two different life stages over two years, a rosette stage and then a flowering stage. But also like the annuals, that population from year to year um, is reliant on seed production to continue that population, right? If it doesn't produce seed, that population is not going to persist. Now, perennial herbaceous plants are different. They, uh, their above ground portion will senesce, but their root systems persist year to year. So these live more than two years um, and they have typically have multiple flowering and seed production events. So with these, their continuation of that population year to year is not reliant on seed production. And in fact, they can take many years off from seed production and rely on just plants living um, through their root systems or spreading through rhizomes or some other means. And in fact, there's several perennial herbaceous invasive plants that basically never set seed. They only spread through asexual means um, or something like that. So examples of um, perennial invasive plants would be purple loosestrife, Ceresia lespedeza, reed canary grass. So these again, aren't reliant on seed production year to year to continue those, um, those populations. So understanding um, the life history or the, the growth type of these invasive plants can help you understand how you need to address them in terms of um, through management. And so for annual and biennial plants that reproduce only by seed and die after setting seed, your goal isn't necessarily to kill them, right? So killing them is good because it keeps them from setting seed as long as it's done before those seeds are produced, right? So your goal for any kind of management for annual or biennials is to stop that seed set. That's what you care about. You don't care if the plant dies necessarily because the plant's gonna die anyway. You wanna stop that seed set. So you need to time your control activities accordingly to that in sense that um, once that plant has seeds on there and those seeds are, are becoming viable, it's too late to manage that plant right then, right? So you've kind of waited too long. So you need to time your control activities so that you can stop flowering or stop, more importantly, stop seed set. That's what you need to think about when you're doing an annual or a biennial plant. For perennial plants, that's not necessarily the case. It'd be nice to prevent seed set, but your ultimate goal, since these have um, root systems that live year to year, your ultimate goal is to, is to kill that root system of those plants. And sometimes it, it's uh, more effective in some plants to wait until they've flowered or wait until the fall, even when they've already have some seed to start control activities because that's when their root system is most vulnerable. That's your ultimate goal for perennial plants you like to prevent seed if you can, but ultimately you're trying to kill those root systems. So it is somewhat of a fundamental difference depending on how those plants grow um, in terms of how you wanna time and decide on what to do management wise. Now, in terms of control techniques, when you're controlling these herbaceous plants, uh, there's quite a few mechanical techniques and that involves things like mowing, weed whipping, propane torching, hand pulling, all these different ways where you're physically damaging or removing those plants. Um, and that's another good example to show another one of my kids. Um, here she is pulling garlic mustard happily, I'm happy to see. Um, it's, this is also an old picture. This is my daughter who now is just finishing up her freshman year in college. Um, but mechanical control techniques work best with annuals and biennials. And so since annuals and biennials are gonna, um, are, are gonna set, set seed and then die, they often don't have really, really well-developed root systems. They often pull up easily. You can cut them down or mow them before they set seed. And oftentimes frost, particularly for annuals, frost will kill them. But you need to do that again before seed production or before the seeds are dry and viable and falling off. Something like garlic mustard, if it has seed on it, as long as the seed pods aren't opening up, you can pull them and bag them and get them out of there. 
Um, for shallow rooted perennials, this also works, but usually you'll need some kind of soil moisture or something that helps you get them out of the ground um, or repeated activities like mowing again and again and again or something like that to deplete the root systems. Now, chemical control. Um, so this is the application of herbicides and it could be synthetic herbicides or organic herbicides, whichever, um, to kill those plants. And so for herbaceous plants, we're typically talking about foliar or soil applications. This is a picture here of Kevin doing a soil application of a pre-emergent herbicide that is um, controlling Japanese stiltgrass. And so pre-emergent is one type of herbicide that really only works on the growing point of seeds. There's also systemic herbicides, which will be translocated down into the roots or contact herbicides, which just burns the tissue that it touches, right? The different kinds of herbicide. And also herbicides can be broad spectrum, which means they generally work on any plant that, uh, they're, that they come in contact with or selective, which they only work on a, a group of plants, like maybe just the broadleaf plants or just the members of the bean family or just the grasses. So there's a lot of choices you can make there um, with your herbicide in terms of how you apply it and uh, what kind it is and the selectivity that'll help you control the invasive species and maintain native species. Chemical control is effective in annuals, biennials, and perennials. We use them for all of that. And then of course there's integrated control and this is um, what we like to always promote in the sense that you're not relying on one method or one control technique to control a population. Instead, you're using combinations of techniques to achieve control. Um, the picture there is a growing season burn that was conducted in an area that had garlic mustard. And so what we found in that one was the burn did a good job of killing a lot of the smaller garlic mustard plants, particularly those first year rosettes or the smaller second year plants. Um, and it made it easier to follow up with a chemical control or hand pulling afterwards to get the plants that were larger that escaped the burn. But that's an idea of a, an integrated control where you're using two methods to address um, a population. Other ideas of integrated control would be after controlling a plant or spraying an area, you overseed it with a desirable plant. It might be manipulating the hydrology of a site if a plant uh, to flood a plant out or something like that, if, if that's one way to do it. Or it could be varying chemical choice, choices, varying timing of control, varying application techniques. So you're not relying on one method over and over, but you're using multiple methods that, that address different life stages of those plants. Alrighty, just a little bit, we're gonna focus a lot on chemical control because those are, that's probably the most complex one, the complicated one. But um, with chemical control, you know, always use appropriate protective gear, safety glasses, long sleeves, long pants, um, so forth and so on, and read the label, follow the label information because the label is the law. In terms of herbaceous plants, most of our applications are foliar applications unless you're doing that soil application. Um, so with a foliar application, you wanna thoroughly cover the leaves with herbicide, spray it, but it not to the point that it's running off and dripping off those leaves, then you're applying a little too much. I like using an herbicide dye. It helps me prevent overspray or prevent skips. And then uh, it's kind of funny, but a foliage needs to be healthy and actively growing to take up that herbicide. So a plant that's under drought st stress or starting to shut down in the fall sometimes or too little too far gone, is not gonna be as easy to control um, as a plant that's healthy and actively growing and taking up that, that herbicide. There's a handful of tools that we use, um, different ways to apply herbicide. Backpack sprayers are really nice. Um, you know, tractor mounted or UTV or ATV mounted sprayers give you a little more capacity. Um, they're really nice to control. And then we have some that are really targeted if you're really looking for um, reducing non-target impacts. And the, the picture on the upper left here is a foam applicator. It's like a where you have herbicide in these tubes and it soaks into this foam at the end and you can kind of just rub and apply the herbicide directly onto the plant like that. Again, it gives you a lot of selectivity. In terms of the different in herbaceous invasive plants in Illinois, this is a small list here, um, but I just wanted to highlight some of the ones here in Illinois 
that um, are invasive that are fall into this herbaceous category. You can see a couple annuals and a, a higher number of biennials and perennials there. Uh, there's more than this, but I just wanted to kind of throw a short list up here. I'm not going to talk about all these. I want to talk about four or five of them, I think, only. Um, but again, we'll have time at the end, hopefully, for questions. So the first one I'm going to talk about today is garlic mustard. I think a lot of us are probably familiar with this plant. It is a biennial, and it's in the mustard family. Uh, it is a non-mycorrhizal plant, which means it does not have to associate or does not need that mycorrhizal fungi in the soil to be able to collect nutrients and grow. It has also been shown to be allelopathic, where it basically exudes um, almost a fungicide out of its roots, which inhibit, inhibit those mycorrhizae um, from developing, which gives it a competitive edge. Uh, this grows in moist forest. Um, mostly it's very shade tolerant and it's easily transported on equipment, shoes, horses, ATVs, um, et cetera. To identify garlic mustard, the first year rosettes will have rounded leaves um, that look like a violet almost. Second year plants will be two to four feet tall, sometimes a little taller, and the leaves will be much more triangular with huge big uh, rounded teeth, as you can see in this picture. The petals are small and four petaled, um, so these have four petals and, and white, um, each flower does. The one that produces fruit, it's a thin upright fruit pod. Uh, it's called a salique. And then the whole plant, when you crush it, um, has a strong garlic odor to it. So even if you walk through an area of garlic mustard, you can smell garlic. So here are the rosettes. So these are the first year plants. You can see here, it does look a lot like a violet. Here's a cluster of them on the left. You can actually see a lot of the dead stalks from the last year's flowering plants in this population. And then you can see the new germinates down there below it too, potentially. Here's a second year plant on the left. You can see those strongly triangular leaves and the white uh, flowers at the top, close up of the white flowers where you can really see those four petals. And then on the right there, you see the salikes, the fruit pods, and they're upright and at the top of the plant. Um, whole infestations will often have some flowers and some seeds at the same time. And I added a picture here after I sent you all the handout because I took this picture two days ago on a roadside here in Southern Illinois, just a small clump of garlic mustard that was right on the roadside on some public land. And I just had to take a picture of it. I'm going to go back and try to pull it and get rid of it. But what we want to do is prevent it from doing this, which is a stand that is already gone fully to seed. And you can see a ton of those seeds there. The plant will start to um, die back and brown up. Those seed pods will, will dry and then pop open. And then you see all the black seeds there just getting ready to be spread. This plant is widespread across Illinois. Here's a map of, of what we know about it. I don't doubt that it's our actually in every county, but these are the counties we have records for it across the whole state. In terms of what to do with garlic mustard, larger infestations, uh, foliar spray is probably your best bet. You'd wanna do glyphosate or triclopyr before flowering. And I'll say a little bit more on that here in a minute. Um, or hand pull it and bag it either before or after flowering if you want to do a non-chemical control. Small infestations, uh, torching it, hand pulling it or spot spraying it works really well. Um, we've had good luck and there seems to be a lot of people using these late fall applications to the rosettes. That seems to be a way of giving you some selectivity because a lot of other plants are senesced and down at that time. So if you do a fall application with glyphosate, um, it, it'll control the, the garlic mushroom when not a, not a lot else is green out there, so you're not impacting other things. Um, it's important to clean your shoes after you work in garlic mustard to prevent seed transport. I moved garlic mustard onto my land accidentally, and so I had to get rid of it. Um, I want to touch on this glyphosate or triclopyr before flowering just for a second, because that is the traditional recommendation but we recently did some studies where we looked at what if you wait until it's done flowering and it has um, already has green 
fully developed seed pods on the plant. If you spray it at that point, does it give you any benefit? And here's a picture of one of our plots. And we did this with the University of Wisconsin. The study just came out in the journal. And what we found was we even waiting until that point, waiting until the flowers all fall off and you have green seed pods on there. We found a heavy reduction of viable seed, um, even with control at that late of a period. Some of it was as high as 99% reduction, but it was all higher than 70% reduction in seed. So if you are controlling a big infestation and you still have some out there, even after the, uh, it stopped flowering and it has green seeds on there, you can still spray it at that point in time and get significant reduction in seed production. So that's good to know. It kind of lengthens that window out a little bit. All righty, the next is Japanese stiltgrass. So this is also called brown top, packing grass, a couple different names. This is an annual warm season shade tolerant grass that grows in moist forest. It is also easily transported on equipment, shoes and horses and everything. This is a weak rooted annual and it pulls up easily. And that's actually an identification characteristic because a lot of other grasses that you may find in the forest uh, in Illinois that has short wide blades, leaves, are mostly perennials that will not pull up easily. So give it a little yank and if it pops out of the ground and you see these really weak roots, it's a good chance that it's um, stilt grass. This plant is uh, one to six feet tall, but it's real sprawling and weak stems. If it gets more than about 12 to 14 inches tall, the plant starts flopping over. So it doesn't really get, um, doesn't stand up on its own. It has those short wide leaves, two to four inches long, an inch, a half an inch to three quarters of an inch wide. And as you can see there, it often has a little whitish or silveryish midrib on the, the leaves. The flowers, uh, it flowers late in the season, late August into September is when it flowers. Uh, and the flowers are thin, spike-like racemes with one or two or three branches. Honestly, you don't see the flowers a lot. They'll flower and then oftentimes the seeds are produced and it's heavy and that whole flowering stalk just kind of falls back down into the plant. As it starts to senesce in the fall, it'll get this purple or brown coloration from the top, which gives it one of its names. You can see on the picture in the top right here, this weak root system, and it actually has aerial roots, and that's where it gets its name stilt grass. They call these stilted roots that'll come from a little higher up on the plant and then um, get into the ground. So it has these little stilts that roots are produced on and just a really weak root system. You can see here the little silvery or whitish midrib, and you can see that the plant is just a thin, wispy plant, right? It's just flopping over and, and laying over. This plant is interesting in that it has two kinds of reproduction. It has the open flowers that I talked about on the top of the plant, but if you dig down it into the plant and you find these little tiny spurs like this, they are closed flowers. And so these closed flowers will self-fertilize and produce fruit um, at lower down in the plant earlier than those flowers above. And so um, a lot of times you don't even know that. And we, they found that um, even in droughty years, oftentimes stiltgrass won't produce those big open flowers, but they'll usually produce these little closed flowers. So I think that's a pretty interesting strategy. Um, here's just a look at the different life stages of stiltgrass. It's starting to germinate now in the southern half of the state. It looks like this. And it'll kind of languish and get, you know, three, four, five inches tall and stay like that really until um, the heat of the summer. And since this is a C4, a warm season grass, the heat of the summer is really where it starts putting on a lot of its biomass. And then it'll flower again uh, late summer, early fall, like uh, August, September. And then oftentimes you'll have this thatch layer like this um, in the bottom right throughout the winter. So you can really identify this year round. And just a closer look at that brown thatch kind of sprawling over everything. Um, I had previously talked about this plant just being a Southern Illinois problem, but we're actually have found a few pockets of it all the way uh, into Northern Illinois. Uh, it's been found in um, Canada now and Michigan and Wisconsin and Iowa. So it definitely has the potential to occupy all of Illinois. And again, we're already seeing it in the Northern part of the state. So if this is not something you're familiar with, 
um, get familiar with it, if you, especially in the northern half of the state, because you can do that early detection and control this before it becomes uh, well established in your area. The good thing about stilt grass is it's actually easy to kill a plant, right? It has those weak root systems, um, even low amounts of herbicide or just minimal pulling it can kill that. Mowing it at the right time low can kill it. So there's a lot of things you can do to kill this plant. That's just there's so much of it, it can overwhelm you and it has such uh, heavy seed production. So some of the things you can do is mow it before seed set. That'll control, um, uh, you know, that you can control sprouts after that with herbicide spraying or you can mow it a couple times and let frost kill it. Hand pull it is a good way to do it. Um, you are going to have to repeat control for several years to deplete that seed bank. The one bad thing is prescribed fire seems to promote it, promote new growth of it, particularly spring fires. Um, seems to do it seems to do really well and it grows comes back with a vengeance. So that doesn't seem to be a control technique. There may be some validity to, to validity to early fall burns as a way of stopping seed production. We don't have any data on that yet. In terms of chemical foliar um, control with glyphosate at even 1%, so a real low rate in water seems to work really well. Grass specific herbicides work pretty well for this as well. They tend to give you a little more selective. And then we recently did a study looking at pre-emergent herbicides on this. And this is just a graph from that study. And what I want you to look here and focus on is this percent cover of stilt grass, this green one. And so you can see there's quite a few options here that did a great job at keeping stilt grass under 10% cover in our plots all year long with a pre-emergent control. So this is stuff we, we, we applied right before it germinated in the spring. And it, as the plants tried to germinate, it killed those, those germinating seeds. Um, some of them like this Esplanade Sure at four and a half ounces per acre, did a great job of controlling, but allowed a lot of native plant um, revegetation. And so that seems to be a great, uh, good option for you. We're gonna write this up into a management guide at some point in the near future, but just to know that pre-emergence, some pre-emergence do seem to work really well for still grass. And then moving on, uh, Ceresia lespediza. This is um, a deep-rooted, semi-woody perennial plant. Uh, it's also fire promoted. It's invading more open spaces, but I do see it in open forest quite a bit. So I added it in here and it has a very long lived seed bank, 30 plus years. It has uh, trifoliate leaves, so three-parted leaves. The leaflets are very slender. They tend to have a blunt tip with a little bristle on it. And that helps you set it apart from our native Lespedezas. Um, it is three to five feet tall. And what I've noticed is it tends to be single stemmed or just a few stems until it gets to about um, the top third of the plant. And then it has a ton of branching at that point in time, which gives the top of it really a dense look. I don't have whitish yellow flowers with a violet center and single seed fruit pods. So you can see the blunt tip here on the picture on the left with a little bristle. You can really see the three parted leaves that are kind of dense all along the stems on the picture to the right. Um, it does have these little white flowers with purple centers. And then you can see here uh, on the, the picture on the left that this plant's already senesced, but you can see that real abundant branching at the top of the plant that really stands out to me. And the picture on the right has these single seed pods. And this plant is across all of Illinois as well. Um, so I'm sure it's even farther widespread than what this map shows, but a big issue across the state. This one is a tough one to control, I'll be honest. A lot of herbicides don't work well for it. Um, it has a very, very well-developed root system. The best methods we have found in terms of foliar would be triclopyr or triclopyr plus fluoxapyr as a foliar spray, and you would apply that kind of early summer through early fall, but um, the best time would be right as it starts to flower, or you can mow it and then let it grow up and, and control those, um, those regrowths and, and do that. Also repeated mowing seems to work or growing season burns in concert with herbicides seems to work as well. But it's one that's guaranteed to take repeated treatments because it has a big seed bank 
and um, it's just hard to deplete those root systems. Um, the next one I wanted to talk about is Japanese chaff flower. So chaff flower is one that's really only in southern Illinois, but it's one that I'm worried about. It was actually recently found in Canada, so I know it has the ability to be across the whole state. So I wanted to add it here. It is in the amaranth family. It's an herbaceous perennial that can get fairly tall. I've seen it up to about eight feet. It's usually three to four feet tall. Um, and it's a habitat generalist. I've seen it all across from the driest areas to the wettest areas. Um, it doesn't like it super, super flooded, but everywhere else it seems to do well. And it has seeds that are easily dispersed with water or animals. How to identify it? It has opposite leaves with arching veins that I always say kind of looks like a dogwood leaf. Um, the nodes are enlarged and reddish on the plant. And the flower is this little bottle brush spike flower that is short at the start, like you see in this picture. But as the seeds develop, it really elongates and gets very, very long as um, the plant matures into fruit. When the fruits are formed, they lie flat across against the stem and have these two little barbs that look like bullhorns off of them, like you see in the picture in the bottom right. And so here's three shots showing the flowers at different lengths. They, again, they start really small, but you can see as they, as they produce fruit on the lower parts of the flowers, the, the stems elongate until you get these really long stems with a few flowers on top and, and nothing but seed there. You can see the, the node, the reddish enlarged node on the right, and then the fruit on the left with those little bullhorns. And then a hole infestation that's a little later in the year just looks like this. Um, just a dense growing plant. It seems to be such an aggressive plant. It can push out things like even um, stilt grass. Again, this plant is really only right now um, been found in southern Illinois and extreme southern Illinois. It was first found in the state along the Ohio River, um, but it has the potential to move all over the place. And again, uh, it's, it was recently found in um, Ontario as well. So certainly moving, one to keep an eye out on. One way it moves, this is just a picture here of all these little seeds stuck in a dog's hair or in the coat, the a sleeve of my coat, is that people and animals move this thing around very easily too. In terms of controlling uh, chaff flower, Hand pulling has seemed to be generally ineffective because the roots break off. Um, if the plants are small or the soil is moist, you can get you can have some effectiveness with hand pulling, but usually um, it's it's going to break off right at the ground level and the roots are going to stay in there. We use foliar applications of many different herbicides have seemed to be very effective, so it is nice that it does seem to um, be easy to kill each individual plant. The key is you want to do that before the fruit are produced. It seems to be most vulnerable at that point. Alrighty, um, two more I have. One is Japanese hops. So that's an annual herbaceous vine that grows in gravel outwashes, sandbars, riparian areas, other disturbed sites across the state. Uh, it has a long seed production and a, a large seed production and a long germination period. So it'll produce a lot of seedlings throughout its growing season. Um, it does tend to scramble over native vegetation, climb into tr trees, and can restrict light to riparian areas. Uh, and these riparian areas may be important for certain wildlife to nest or certain uh, native plants to grow. So it does have a particular um, damage to some of our rare species. How to identify this? Again, this is a vine. It has palmately lobed opposite leaves. And so you see the, the leaves have five to seven lobes on it. It almost looks like a Virginia creeper or something like that, or an English ivy. Uh, but the big thing is the entire plant is really, really scratchy, rough textured, almost like Velcro. The stems, the um, petioles, the leaves, everything is just scratchy um, and it, it, it makes you itch. Uh, it is like kind of like Velcro. It, they do have a pair of downturned bracts at the stem right where the leaf comes in as well. So here you can see two leaves coming out. Here's a bunch of leaves uh, growing in this vine as it's kind of just occupying this area. And you can see those, each one has those five to seven lobes on it. 
We do have a native hops, which typically has three lobes. And then you can see here's those pair of downturn bracts on the picture on the left, uh, right where the leaves come in. And you can see all those little barbs, back facing barbs that make this whole plant scratchy. Just another look at it. Here it is climbing up into a tree. Um, and here's starting to flower right here. So really that uh, annual vine, super scratchy with those palmately lobed leaves will really help you identify hops. It is found across the state. It typically likes the big river systems where you'll see it mostly, but it can be found really anywhere. Controlling it, um, mowing, pulling, and burning, since it is an annual, can be effective. But because of that long germination window, you're going to need to do repeat treatments. Foliar applications um, can be effective, glyphosate or triclopyr, but you're going to need aquatic safe versions because this really likes growing next to water. You don't want to do that midsummer before flowering, and even better would be a couple different treatments throughout the growing season. And the last one I'll mention here quickly is fig buttercup. And so this is actually a spring ephemeral wildflower, but an exotic one that's pushing out our native spring ephemerals. It's often one of the first plants to bloom in the spring, and it prefers bottomlands and riparian areas. It has dark green heart or kidney shaped leaves that are very shiny, bright yellow buttercup flowers that have many petals, typically eight or more often. Um, and then especially the way to look at it is if you pull down there and look close to the ground, it'll produce tiny little rounded bulblets at the base of the plant. If you dig it up, it has elongated tubers, almost like little fingers sticking in the ground. So here you can see the leaves, the kind of rounded heart-shaped or kidney-shaped leaves and just a non-flowering uh, infestation on the left. And then a big stand of it here, just covering an area. Um, a beautiful plant, I will not deny, but it just has the ability to form these huge carpets that'll exclude any other plant. And then you can see these little elongated tubers as the roots. And then if you look down at the base of the plant, you can see all these little rounded bulblets. And that's really how it spreads more so by these bulblets than by seed. Uh, these will wash downstream and move and, and break off of this plant and spread and form new infestations. This plant is a northeastern Illinois problem um, where we have most of it in the state, but it's definitely good to keep an eye out for it anywhere. There's some lookalikes that are native, so make sure you look for those kidney shaped leaves, those many uh, petaled flowers, and then get good positive ID or check it with somebody before starting control. For small infestations, um, hand pull or dig those plants. Be sure to remove all those bulblets and tubers since that's how it persists and spreads. Those are also really great ID characteristics, those bulblets. Um, foliar applications of glyphosate um, just before or right at the point of flowering seems to work, but it is a hard plant to kill and it's going to take repeat treatments. All righty, I know I covered this super quick, but I wanted to cover all those species and still have a little time for questions. So just in summary, uh, the goal of management when you're managing these herbaceous plants, again, is to prevent, reduce, or eliminate those negative impacts. Um, with annual or biennial plants, we're stopping seed production. With perennial plants, we're killing the root system. Uh, there's lots of different herbaceous invaders. Uh, we like using integrated approaches and mixing or, and, and combining different management or control methods to get the best control. And I give you some resources and there's tons of good information in those. Uh, and I definitely recommend using those when you can.